Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Group Dentistry Now show. I'm Bill Newman, and we are approaching episode 100. So we're, we're pretty excited. We thank, thank really the audience for, for their loyalty and, and jumping on uh, every single episode. And whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening in on Apple or Google or Spotify or wherever you listen in, we, we really appreciate that. Uh, without an audience, we wouldn't have a show. And we always, we always have great guests. So that's why you keep coming back. And we are going to have a conversation today with Mike Baird. He is the CEO of Henry Shine One. He's been in that role for a little bit over two years. So, so Mike, uh, welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show. Fantastic. Great to be with you, Bill. Yeah, it's um, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started to record this about Henry Shine One and just the, the breadth of products and services that Henry Shine has, right? So you've got Henry Shine, and then we have Henry Shine One. Um, so you know, I, I'd love for Mike, first off, to give us a little bit of your background prior to joining Henry Shine One, uh, and then what you've been doing in that role with Henry Shine One. But then we probably need to talk about what it is specifically that Shine, Henry Shine One does versus Henry Shine. Yeah, great, great questions. Well, thank you for that. Um, I've been here, as you said, two, two years. My prior background, I've been in healthcare for about 12 or 13 years now, uh, primarily in the telemedicine space. Uh, so I founded a, a telemedicine company focused on helping uh, healthcare institutions, hospitals with acute care, um, ended up running uh, a company, American Well, uh, that was one of the largest telehealth companies, took it public in, in 2020. And then the opportunity came to join Henry Schein One. And I was, I was very intrigued by, by the opportunity. And we'll talk about why Henry Schein One. But, but my background is primarily in technology, in cloud and SaaS companies, and, and driving healthcare companies, which was a really great fit for what we're trying to do at Henry Schein One. As you, as you mentioned, Henry Schein does a lot of things, right? Pr primarily their distributor for just about everything you would need in a dental office. And you know, over the last 25 years, they've managed to acquire a number of software companies, but, but really hadn't done uh, enough to really bring those assets together. And the, the launch of, of Henry Shine One, which is a joint venture between KKR, a large private equity firm, and, and, and Henry Shine, was to really build a software-first, software-focused business to make sure to, to deliver what dental practices need in, in the way of technology and only technology. So all we do is software. Every single software asset that was once part of Henry Schein is, has been brought together at Henry Schein One. And that particular focus on the word one is, is critical. We have over 70 different software products around the world. We're, we're number one in 12 countries. Obviously we play very heavily in the practice management space, but we also have a number of other assets. And our ultimate goal is to try to bring those assets together in a portfolio of products that, that really meet all the software needs of a dental practice. And so that's really what we were formed for and what we're, we're trying to do. So Henry Shine One, in essence, is really the, the technology side of, well, Henry Shine, but then there's that partnership, right? It's a JV, you have KKR as well involved. That's right. 100% uh, focused on driving software, and, and today we're we're fortunate to be the largest dental software company in the world. Wow. Okay, I did not know that. That's good. Um, so we kind of look at the what's going on in the dental industry. What are some trends that that you're seeing currently, and then you know what what do you expect to see in in the near future? And my guess is this is going to be technology or software focused. <laughs> For sure, it has to be. I, I think I would actually start with our founding mission is that idea to connect all the technology uh, in the dental practice as one, really bring those assets together. I think if you're a dentist, and I, you know, I work with lots of dentists, a lot of my family members are, are in the dental field, you know, you could have 10 different vendors to bring in all the various software assets, 
but wouldn't it be nice if you just had one <laughs> and if you could bring it all together, if it worked intelligently the way you would expect it to, I think that that push for what we would call an enterprise, you know, based software solution that, that really meets the needs of a practice from end to end is definitely an emerging trend and something that we feel like we are uniquely poised to deliver. But beyond us and looking just at sort of our strategy, I think there's a number of other big uh, trends that we're seeing. Uh, first and foremost, I'd point to the cloud. I think the cloud has historically been uh, less, um, less visible in dentistry. I think dentists are sort of used to using, uh, you know, software that's installed on a computer in the closet somewhere. But, but when you think about your average practice with, you know, a handful of uh, clinicians and desk, you know, a front desk support and a dentist or two, you know, really, I think the last thing they want to be doing is supporting a server in their closet. And, you know, you look at why cloud-based businesses have thrived over the last decade in virtually every single other industry. And it's because of that idea that you, you, you really can have uh, the simplicity of, of the cloud. You know, someone else deals with upgrades. Someone else deals with security. Someone else deals with making sure that, that these things work very nicely together. You, you move away from highly customized software that really works uh, across broad, um, broad settings. So if you look at products like Microsoft Office 365, if you look at Salesforce and the way that's grown, if you even look at things like the Adobe Creative Cloud, we're seeing this trend away from on-premise software towards cloud. And not only does it make it so that you never have to deal with updates, you've always got your, your data backed up, you never have to worry about security. It's much easier to secure something in the cloud than it is, you know, 130,000 different dental offices in the country. Uh, it, it really drives uh, that stability and, and simplicity. But it also now enables other things you can do because once your data is in the cloud and you can get all of it in one place, well, now we have other things we can start to do. So the next trend I would point to would be analytics. So now that we have not only practice data from one or two or three practices, but hundreds of thousands of practices uh, gathered together in the cloud, well, now we can start to look at analytics, not only at a practice level or a group practice level, but even someday looking at trends comparing cross industries. So imagine if you were able to say, you know, how does my practice look versus other practices in the state of Utah or in the Mountain West uh, or, you know, in the Northeast, South, you know, et cetera. That kind of intelligence, I think, will be critical for practices to start to really zero in on the ways to be successful and to find um, the best way to have uh, clinical excellence. Uh, you know, we've seen this in my prior work in, in healthcare uh, being a very common trend. I think it also mirrors up very nicely with the trend of DSOs and group practices that we see in a big way. Obviously, if you're trying to manage uh, a multiple of practices, it becomes really necessary to know how does practice one, two, and three compare with, you know, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and so we see that as being a, a major trend and one that we've started to invest in in a big way to make sure we have analytic solutions for, for our customers. We, we think this really helps practices, you know, do their daily huddle and figure out ways to, to optimize uh, the day in and day out of their business. The, the next trend I would probably highlight would be uh, everything around cost reduction. You know, I think uh, every practice out there is trying to find ways to um, reduce their overall cost load and, and drive more, more profit. We think technology can help with that in a big way. Um, you know, I, I think of a, a relatively simple application we launched with uh, Voice Perio. So the fact that, you know, the, the computer can actually listen in and capture those measurements very quickly means I've now saved hygienist time. So they can be more productive helping patients as opposed to having to enter numbers in on a computer. So I think looking for ways to, to drive cost reductions in the office. And then the last big trend I would highlight, and, and you know, we're happy, happy to talk more about these if you've got questions, but would be AI. So AI has long been one of these things we hear about all the time. Elon Musk is out there talking about how AI is gonna take over the world. And you know, to, to date, it's been relatively slow adoption uh, across many industries, but we're starting to see very tangible applications in, in clinical fields. So, you know, today AI is great. I can ask my Siri to turn on the lights or set up an appointment for me or whatever it may be. Um, 
we're probably a long ways from what we would think of as sentient AI that drives our cars for us and does other things. But in dental, you look at something like imaging where we have millions of dental records and an AI can go through and scan all of that and start to see trends. And we, we find that those algorithms are actually much better at diagnosing ailments and caries and other things than the human eye. And by the way, this is really good for patients and for dental providers, right? Patients benefit because they can find and identify issues much earlier than you might have otherwise. You know, providers like this because they obviously want to be able to have the right treatment recommendations and care plans for their patients. So this is an example where we're starting to see high tech uh, coming into the dental practice. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm biased, but we, we see that coming together through technology. So those are a couple of the trends that, that, that I'm seeing and you know, happy to elaborate on any of those if, if you'd like, Bill. No, that, that, that's great, Mike. I mean, you think about, and we had recently had Melissa Marquez from Jarvis Analytics, who's now Jarvis being part of Henry Schein One, and that analytics trend is is, is pretty interesting. Um, you know, you've got you've got the data, and there's there's data out there, right? We know it's out there, so you have to yeah. gather it, and then you have to be able to take that, interpret it, and then it has to be actionable, right? So once you have, you can have a lot of data, but if you don't act on it, it doesn't really matter. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things there you can dive pretty deep on. And then, then to your point, you, AI was the last thing that you mentioned, uh, but that seems to be all the talk in the industry, right? But you know, as we talk about AI, I think still a lot of people don't necessarily know what it means for their practices or for their groups. Yeah, well, just to follow up on that on analytics as, as an example, it's technically possible for any dentist to try and go and export a data set and write some SQL queries to figure out how that works. But again, that's not their expertise. What we try to do at scale when we're serving you know, thousands upon thousands of practices, we know what those reports should look like. And, and by the way, we can make sure that they're accurate. You know, If you make a little error as a dentist in your, your SQL query, that's gonna have a big impact on you. When we're doing that, thousands upon thousands of time, times every single week as a standardized report, it really makes it just much simpler for, for a practice to see that and to be able to track that over time. On the AI side, it's been really fun to see uh, just in the last month or so, we've seen a number of companies get FDA class two approval for their AI uh, solutions. This is really exciting. And, and I, I highlight that because when you start talking about FDA approval, this isn't just a theory. It's not a white paper, right? These are our, um, solutions that are in the wild today being used in practices. And, and you'll see us rolling this out very shortly embedded in our Dentrix and other platforms. Uh, and we think once dentists try it out, they will never want to go back. It's just really, cool. why, why wouldn't you want that, that assist to, to help you make sure you're, you're helping serve your patients and, and, and having the best clinical outcomes possible? So you talked about your mission statement, which is is pretty bold in my opinion, because you know there there is a lot of technology out there, right? And some technology doesn't talk to other technology; it doesn't integrate. And when you start to really think about everything that goes on in a dental office, that's that's a pretty big task. So, where, can you tell me, you know, how how do you how does Henry Sherman go about trying to do that? Well, we think we're uniquely positioned to do this. There are a number of arenas of, of software that the dentists deal with. Obviously, first and foremost is the practice management platform. 99% uh, of practices use that today. I know there's still a few places that try to get by with you know, paper charts, but the reality is it's sort of the operating system for, for the practice. If you look at other applications like uh, what we call patient relationship management, you know, a lot of the marketing uh, platforms and campaign uh, drivers, well, that's becoming increasingly key for dentists to engage their patient base. If you look at uh, your online presence, what you do with a website and what you do to manage your reputation online, obviously that's, that's, that's critical. Uh, when you look at things like your claims and, and then how you're processing it. So these are different areas that are all highly related. And so the best analogy that I always like to use, if you think about something like Microsoft Office, 10 years ago, we would always wait for, you know, the newest version of Excel 97 to come out and we would all rush to Best Buy and, you know, get the new version of Word or whatever it is. Today, with a simple subscription, I buy that whole platform 
And, you know, there might be applications like Teams that you think, well, why am I ever going to need Teams? And then suddenly there's a pandemic and we all use Teams pretty much all day long, right? But these, these applications, Outlook, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, so on and so forth, while they're all very different, they're all intertwined where it matters, right? You have the same uh, password across all of them, a single sign-on, as it were. When I want to create uh, an appointment in, in Outlook, it syncs to, to my phone uh, and across all those devices. When I want to share a document, right, there's commonality. The, the user experience and the user interface is very similar across all those applications. And so once you've learned how to use PowerPoint, well, it's not that hard to learn how to use Word, as an example. That same trend that, that, that we all witnessed kind of happen uh, really about a decade ago, whether you use the Google suite or Microsoft, we think is happening in dental. Obviously, if you're going to have a very robust uh, claims uh, application uh, and, and, and to process the right ways, you've got to be tightly integrated with your, uh, with your practice management system. And, and, and you know, we do that today. Obviously, a lot of people use our, our claim systems. Well, when I have an appointment cancel in my PMS and I want to figure out the right patients to, to fill that, well, why wouldn't I want a very tight connection between my patient software, you know, my patient marketing software, or when I'm trying to uh, build a campaign and push that out and, uh, and affect my, my online reputation? These are all interrelated tasks. And so to the extent that there is something that helps bring those together, well, we think the more that we can drive a similar user experience you know, unified uh, authentication and identities across that, unified data. You know, we talk about things like Jarvis and, and analytics. You know, today, a lot of that's around some of the key, uh, you know, clinical outcomes. But look, I should be able to use that same Jarvis data on my claims data, and I should look at it on how well my campaigns perform and so on and so forth. So we really believe that all these applications have common threads and we are uniquely poised to bring that together, uh, given the, the wide variety of software applications we have. Most people don't even realize that Henry Schein One is developing and supporting 70 different software applications around the world. Uh, it's, that's probably too many. We're actually working on streamlining that portfolio a little bit, but uh, the, the ones that matter in each of those categories, we would love to see those work seamlessly. And I, I envision a world very soon where you basically buy your dental 360 platform uh, of some sort that has all the applications you need, uh, and maybe even some that you don't think that you need. But as time evolves and as you have more needs in your practice, it's there ready for you to do with. And I, I think to your point, one, one of the big challenges, I think across all the industries and, and, and certainly in, in dental is the uh, retention and then also you know, this trying to find you know, new employees and part of the workforce disappeared and didn't come back. And so we're training people that may not have any dental experience to, to handle, you know, front office tasks or, you know, regional manager tasks. So when you talk about, you know, the, the fact that the systems feel very comfortable, right? They're similar. And, and, and so I would think the onboarding process and ongoing training would be much easier. Yeah, we, we take some of these things for granted. I, this is a silly story that I'll share really quick. My, my mother-in-law uh, thinks that she's no good at technology. And in training her over time on how to use some of these applications, I thought this was really funny where eventually she's, I said, hey, you need to save the document. She goes, is that the little Utah icon in the top? <laughs> and so I, I recognize that as a, it's a floppy disk that, you know, that we've used you know, 20 years ago. But to her, that's the state of Utah. <laughs> and that's how she remembers it. Well, when you go across different applications and you're suddenly having different icons and different ways of doing things, that is a lot of complexity to ask someone to do. We take that for granted if we're in an industry and if we use applications every single day. But to your point, with the great resignation, with the labor shortages that we have, anytime you have someone new coming in and, and we expect them to learn 10 different applications, each of which has their own icons, their own you know, menu nesting and structure, that's complication. And that's part of what makes it hard for offices to reduce their costs and focus not on the technology, but on treating patients. And so to the extent that we can simplify that, that's our job. I view that as our mission to make it so that we let dentists and, and, and practice professionals do what they do best, which is to serve the patient and not have to worry about what does that icon mean up there? Is that the state of Utah? <laughs> does, that, does that mean save? Uh, that's the kind of thing we need to focus on. 
That's, that's funny. I like what you said about um, really the practice management software, the PMS being the, the operating system. So that's almost like the, you know, your central point or your hub, and then these other technologies that kind of surround it or enhance it um, or, or work well with it. But um, you know, that's something, whether it's you know, Dentrix Enterprise or Ascend or the, you know, the uh, Dentrix that, that we all know, oh, yeah. um, it's, uh, that, that seems to me to be the kind of the basis where everything else is, is built from almost. But that, that's correct. And then look, I should say as much as I believe that we can build these common applications and, and you can buy that whole suite of uh, products from Henry Shine One, we also have that robust data platform that others can tap into. So if you really have another program you love and it works really well and you clearly need practice management data, our job is to make that seamless as well. And so we've never had more connections than we do today with other competitors and, and, and uh, collaborators in, in the field. And that's also really important that we support that because ultimately we're building standards that the industry can use. So Henry Shine One works with quite a few DSOs and emerging dental groups. So Mike, what are you and, and your team, what are you seeing as far as challenges inefficiencies, things like that, 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 that your customers may be experiencing, specifically in multi-site? Yeah. Well, I think number one, if you're a DSO, you have to think about what sets you apart from the other thousand DSOs out there. I mean, they're everywhere, right? This is the new hot thing to start a, a DSO. And I've seen DSOs come at that in a number of ways. Sometimes it's through a particular culture, the way they treat their uh, their providers, how they train them. A lot of them come at this from a process and efficiency standpoint. It's through a technology specialty. But I think there are very common threads that we see uh, across virtually all DSOs. The first is standardization of some form. If you're going to get efficiency, uh, that, that's something that, that DSOs look, look at. So how can we uh, eliminate the challenge of different PMS systems? Generally speaking, we see uh, DSOs standardizing on um, a tech stack of some sort because that helps them drive alignment and standardization on workflow and processes. It makes it so it gets easier for them to make claims in the same way. It lets them centralize their data and start to do analytics uh, and, and organization-wide reporting. And that those familiar interfaces of some sort will also help them maximize their efficiency and profitability as well. And that's really where economies of scale come along. So I think number one is standardization. Uh, there, there are some DSOs that actually their calling card is the reverse of that. You know, you be you and do your practice exactly that, that you've always done it. And we'll try to help with things like purchasing or whatever it may be. But ultimately, the, the DSOs that, that I believe are having the greatest impact tend to drive towards some level of standardization. The second area that I would highlight is just the management of cost and resources. Uh, I think uh, some of that ties to standardization, but being able to, to drive similar processes, um, they, they tend to focus on very robust claims management services of some sort. So they can use that, they can really optimize their, their, their claims uh, reimbursement rates and making sure uh, they can collect uh, everything they need to collect. Uh, often having some sort of singular database and consolidated reporting, which again comes from that standardization point, lets them be able to compare offices in an apples to apples way. I can now use something like Jarvis, overlay that across a variety of practices and say, no, no, wait a minute, your claims reimbursement rate is very different than your neighbor in the same state, in the same city, you know, down the road. Well, why is that? We should be able to, to check into that or, you know, the various, um, uh, cases that you have, what's your case acceptance rate? You, you know, oh, wait, those are very, very different. Why is that? And I think when they leverage that technology, they can really drill into managing their, their cost and resources. Obviously that extends to things like procurement as well. That's less on the technology side, right? Folks love to work with Henry Shine in general because they can get um, scale uh, on their purchasing. I would say the third area that, 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 that ties across this as well is, is managing their complex hardware and needs. And so we see cloud as being a, a very key differentiator for uh, DSOs. And if they're, you know, our cloud solutions today, like Dentrix Ascend, um, like our Dentally product uh, over in Europe, 
these products are outselling uh, on-premise solutions by roughly three or four to one uh, today. The, the future is cloud. We, we know that, you know, there may be lots of practices that haven't converted to that, but if you look at new sales, far and away, people are buying cloud. Well, why would a DSO do that? It's really simple. They no longer have to maintain servers and hardware in, you know, 100 or 200 locations, and they can just rely on other solutions in the cloud. That, that reduces the, the risk of security issues, as an example, as opposed to having 200 sites that can each be a threat vector. Well, now I have one. Uh, and, and, and ideally, in time, as we add more and more security, we recently got you know, SOC 2 certification. We're working on um, uh, multi-factor uh, uh, authentication. You know, these are things that make it so that security becomes uh, less of an issue those all lower the complexity of what a DSO is trying to manage in, in a multi-office uh, setup. So all of those are ways that we see technology really helping uh, DSOs. And then the last one that I see in particular working with vendors, large or small, is the advent of the customer success manager. When, when you have a relationship with someone like Henry Schein One, you know, we have customers that are using 15, 20 different solutions from us being able to have that extra service and support, a dedicated account manager who can make sure that it all works uh, correctly is a critical difference that DSOs really expect. That's something that we've invested heavily in. We, we've added roughly 50 or so of these customer success managers. And that is really helping make sure uh, that DSOs can get all the support they need to, 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 to make all their technology work together as it should. The last one that I would point out that departs a little bit from technology, but that is related is we're, we're also seeing a major market trend for the future on the interoperability of medical data and dental data. We've long known that, 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 that the dental record and the you know, dental um, medical data is highly correlated to uh, many outcomes uh, that we see in our standard health record. And yet, historically, it's been perhaps more complex than we would like to, to integrate those. So we're seeing a major trend, especially with the largest DSOs, to look for ways to, to integrate that data and or leverage it in some form or fashion. In particular, uh, if DSOs have relationships with health systems of any sort, um, where increasingly we're getting asked for ways to be able to read uh, electronic healthcare records um, from a health system and bring that in as part of the dental record or vice versa, being able to have that dental record for a patient be easily accessible for um, uh, a clinician or a doctor of some sort to see the full case of the patient. So this is another big area that, that we're seeing. Historically, you know, Henry Schein, one and others have used technologies like HL7 that make it so you can share that data. But, but generally that's, um, that's a, uh, an effort that takes time. There, there's, uh, there's work that has to be done to set up interoperability between those systems. We're investing in a lot of um, both platforms and technologies to make that simpler, uh, to try and remove some of the barriers. So you may think, hey, I would love to see the Epic record on this patient, but then when you get 2,000 pages of every medication that they've taken since they were a toddler, you know, and their, their immunizations and other things, some of that might be useful, some of it may not be useful. So what are ways that we, as a, as a, as a, as a key stakeholder in the information of health, can help make that simpler that uh, you know, we can connect things easier? So one example that we're working on, we recently got approved to be in the Epic App Orchard. So this is sort of an application uh, framework. Think of apps on the Epic platform where you will eventually be able to get you know, data from Dentrix uh, very easily through that, that average framework in a standardized manner. So you don't have to invest in major integrations where we, we hire a bunch of IT people to build that, that, that database connectivity. It's already an application you can just download. So I think that's a big trend for DSS to think about is what's their data interoperability strategy and how are they going to be able to do that in such a way to get the healthcare data they need to share dental data, data when they need it, but also to be able to use the industry leading dental platforms like Dentrix uh, in their in their practices, let me pause there. That was a lot, but any of those you'd like me to go deeper on? Well, I, I definitely want to get back to uh, the medical dental integration because I think there's there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there, and it's 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 really important. It's also, as I think most 
providers that have tried to do this. Now it's pretty complicated too. Um, but you, you touched on something about the, um, the account managers at Henry Schein One. And so, you know, our, we talk quite a bit to the people, our, our, our audience at um, Group Dentistry now, um, our members. And what we hear time and time again is, you know, that the product or the solution is, is one thing. But if you don't have the support and the education behind it, it, does, it, it, it doesn't matter, right? So you get the best widget <laughs> or software, but if you don't have somebody that can help teach you that and support oh. you, then it, do, it, it, does, it doesn't really matter. So I think what I'm trying to say is the training and the education, that account manager and that support is as important as the technology behind it. And it's nice to know, so you have dedicated account representatives from Henry Schein One that'll support those different, those 70 different software solutions you have globally. Yeah, you're, 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 you're spot on. If you think about a DSO that goes out and buys four different practice groups, right? Well, they're all going to have different computers, different network, you know, applications in place. And as you said, you can have the world's best application, but if it's on a, uh, on a PC that doesn't have enough memory, as an example, or uh, maybe one of these offices has a bunch of other things. They're they're running their accounting software at the same time as their dental software, and you know there's some there's some gaps there. Having someone that can help troubleshoot that with you in real time and help make sure that you are up to spec with the, the recommendations in the industry. These are very critical things that you can't just. You know, sometimes we think of dental offices almost like a home user. Well, you we just go to the store, buy the software, install it yourself. It's going to be fine. But that doesn't actually work, particularly in a DSO, which is a very complicated, large enterprise, right? They need help to make sure that uh, we, we check all the boxes around security and stability and, you know, throughput on uh, your data and, and making these things work in the way that they need to. And, and our, our customer success managers are a critical part of that. So now back to, to the point about medical dental integration or interoperability. Um, again, a lot of talk around it. Uh, you see some different models forming. You see uh, some DSOs in particular where you have an integrated practice. So you have primary care and then you have um, dental. So in, in that case, you may have general dental, you may or have orthodontics and pediatric, right? You could have all that under one roof. So that's kind of one scenario that you see. And then in some cases, you also see where there may be vision involved too. So you may have, you may have that thrown in there. Um, so that's one. And then the other you see is um, like, for an example, would be like a pro health dental. So um, where they are partnering with healthcare systems. So they're really providing the dental services and they, they're, but they're not necessarily co-located. Maybe in some cases they are, but they're referring. So their dentists are maybe doing blood pressure and, and checking for certain things that they can refer to primary care. And then primary care should be checking for oral issue, oral systemic issues as well. And kind of forwarding those over to dental. What do you see? Do you see any models that, that seem to be performing really well, or is it too early to tell? Well, I, I definitely like that idea, the pro-health example, right? And, and some of these affiliations back with medical providers, you're starting to see very simple um, medical screening things that you can do in a dental visit uh, on a regular basis, right? right? Like often they'll do, you know, they'll, 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 they'll check for various uh, uh, things in the mouth that can be indicators of oral cancers, uh, as an example. Uh, obviously, there's there's heavy links between things like peri disease and cardiac disease. I, I think ultimately, our job is to try to be where the market's going to be and help support this. You know, I think the first wave of thought around this was, well, my hospital uses EHRX, you know, whether that's Athena or Cerner or Epic or whatever. So just build me a connection, right? But the reality is, uh, most DSOs, if you look at their patients they probably go to a lot of different medical facilities. And so our job isn't so much the one-to-one -one connection, it's the one-to-many and thinking about that. And so increasingly, I believe that the future will be uh, health information exchanges of some sort. So it's less about, well, how do I connect a dentist and a practice? Do I need to build a connection to each of the four hospitals in my town? Well, that might be a little bit tough. Or is there a way that we can help drive these medical information exchanges. And so we're working with vendors like Redox or Health Gorilla, uh, um, the, the um, 
Care Alliance and, and Care Equality, uh, I think it's Commonwealth is, is, is the one that I was referring to, to figure out ways to be able to have uh, bulk data exchanges on a one-to-many basis. And I think that will be critical. So that if you're a pro health, uh, to your example, and you work with you know, 10 different uh, institutions, knowing that we each use a standard and can do data interchange on a, on a client ID number of some sort uh, will make it easier uh, for them to help. And, and usually in that definition, we can actually go in and say, this is the data that I need. Because one of the challenges, if you ever talk to a doctor that's used you know, Epic or any of the major EHRs, there's so much data on a patient that, that frankly would overwhelm uh, a provider or a dentist. And so figuring out how to filter that and extract just what you need. These are the kind of things that we're thinking about as we work very closely with dentists, with health systems, and, and, and frankly, with a lot of thought leaders in the marketplace to try and, and shape a, a future where we believe we will increasingly see more of that interchange between you know, medical leadership and dental practitioners. So as we start to wrap this up, and so this will be the, and make sure I didn't miss anything, Mike. So I, I know we, we covered quite a bit there in, in a relatively short period of time. Some interesting, I mean, really interesting things regarding you know, where the, where the industry is headed. Uh, and, and a lot of it is, is technology. I mean, when you look at innovation uh, and, and again, you know, there's innovation on, on, on the clinical product side of things, but where we, where I see a lot of the advancement in the industry, and this is recent, you know, this is within the past, I'd say five to 10 years. It, it seems really focused on, on the technology side, you know, whether it's, you know, creating efficiencies, uh, do, doing more with, with less people, right. Um, being able to, to look at analytics and, and, um, you know, maybe take a look at what's going on, uh, whether it's patient recall, uh, you, you come from telehealth, there's teledentistry now, there are platforms like that. I know Henry Schein one has those, um, talk about responsibility. So what, what, what is Henry Schein one's responsibility really to drive this advancement and, and how do you do that as an organization? That's a great question, Bill. To me, the operative word is simplification. Technology for technology's sake doesn't actually help anybody. So look, I'm, I'm a tech geek. I've been in technology for 25 years uh, of, of my career across various industries. And sometimes we have a tendency to over-engineer <laughs> or, or throw technology at people. Like if you came to my house and saw all the things I've done and my wife just wants to pull her hair out, this doesn't actually help me. It doesn't make my life any better. Now, I think it's cool because uh, I'm a tech nerd, but uh, I think at the end of the day, our job is to make things easy. I, I like to use an analogy uh, in this. If, if you've ever used Uber, Lyft, or any of those uh, systems, it massively changed the way that we interacted with a very rudimentary service, you know, getting in a car and moving somewhere. Today, I, I, I push a button from wherever I am. I can get an instant update on where they are. I get into that car. It drives me somewhere. I get out. I never exchange money or a credit card. Uh, I didn't have to like look at a map and figure out how to give them directions to me. I get out, I'm automatically paying them, right? They, I automatically get a receipt that can be forwarded straight to my, my cost reimbursement system with my, my assistant. Um, they knew exactly how to get me and where to go with their GPS. To me, that is a frictionless transaction. If you compare that with the dental world, and when I go to pay for something and how long it takes to get it, a claim reimbursed, both for the practice and for the patient, right? These are things that today are not frictionless. And so I think ultimately, whether we're trying to simplify the user interface and make it so that our applications all look really simple, uh, similar and easy to use, if I'm working on ways to streamline the claims process to make that happen faster, if I'm looking at technologies like uh, uh, that Perio voice uh, tool that we have that makes it uh, very easy for one assistant to just take your perio readings very quickly and not have to pull you know someone else away from a patient to plug numbers into a computer these are all examples of ways that we're trying to dramatically simplify what happens in the office and so my view is if we bring technology in and it simplifies what you do right you no longer have to write your own queries we have a very simple interface called jarvis that every morning will tell you all the data that you need with the charts and and it's similar every day when we simplify that we let dentists practice dentistry. They get to focus on patients and they don't have to worry about technology. 
They don't have to worry if the server is working in the closet. We forgot to upgrade it, you know, to the latest version of software. If I need to worry about some security hack that's happening, we want to take the technology away from their worry box. And I think the more we do that, that simplicity, this is what delights dentists and lets them treat patients. So I think that's a great way to finish things up. Um, you know, what I, what I would say to, to the audience is that um, working with Henry Schein One um, was at Henry Schein's national sales meeting uh, relatively recently, uh, not, not too long ago. And th the one thing I'll say is you probably don't know as a provider or a DSO operator, the breadth of products and services that Henry Schein One has to offer. So, um, you know, when, when, when you think Dentrix, um, you know, that's, that's one of 70 <laughs> offerings that they have. So I, I, would, I would really um, take a look at what they have to offer. Uh, HenryShineOne.com, right? Pretty easy. You go there and you, you can um, find things out or um, one of the account representatives that has that knowledge base. But um, any final words, Mike, before we um, sign off? Look, really appreciate you taking the time, Bill. Great to be with you and with your audience. Uh, folks can reach me pretty easily at Henry Shine One. Uh, I actually welcome your feedback, and we're all still learning, you know, where this industry wants to go. And so, you know, find me at uh, find me at Dykema, find me at uh, ADSO, find me at one of the shows, and I would love to get your your feedback uh, as as we collectively try to to improve the industry. And just really with you and your listeners today, Bill. Okay, well, you heard it. Mike, Mike said, don't be shy. Stop and see him or reach out to him on, on LinkedIn or um, you can find him certainly uh, at any one of the, the number of DSO shows that are coming up. Uh, so appreciate your time. Uh, we had Mike Baer, CEO of Henry Shine One. And uh, until next time, this is Bill Newman for the Group Dentistry Now Show. Thanks for listening in. The Group Dentistry Now Show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today and please tell your colleagues about us.